sun will rise, the sun will rise, bringing life to the earth as it springs from the ground. The sun will rise, the sun will rise, won't you dry all your tears, lay your burden down, won't you dry Grace and peace to you, church family. We are so thankful to be able to set aside this time to be together with you, worshiping Jesus and experiencing his presence together. As we prepare our hearts today, maybe you're weary and searching for rest. Maybe you're mourning and longing for comfort. Maybe you're failing and you need strength. Or maybe you're lonely and you're hungering for a place to belong. Whatever place you find yourself in today, know this. Jesus, the one who loved you, the one who gave himself for you, welcomes you here today with wide open arms. So let's pour out our hearts. Let's receive his love and his power as we sing and we pray united in him today. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory and creation now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. And what a beautiful name it is. And nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was great.
Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power. It is so good to be worshiping with you together this morning in the spirit of Jesus. We're going to read some scripture together, and I'd love for you to read the portions in white with me. Oh, Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans are too numerous to list. You have no equal. May those who search for you be filled with joy and gladness in you. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, the Lord is great. Amen. Great is the Lord, my conqueror. He has never failed me yet. Through all my trials, tribulations, he will deliver. The greatest one, he's God. Great is Lord, my conqueror, he has never failed me yet. Through all my trials, tribulations, you will deliver the greatest one, he's God. And great is the Lord, my comforter, he has never left me yet. In all my days, I'm never seen the righteous forsaken, the greatest one, he's God. Great is the Lord, my calm. 
tribulations he will deliver the greatest one he's got amen church amen if you've recently joined us we are so thankful to be worshiping together with you in the spirit of jesus no matter how we feel on the inside Jesus is right there next to us. He never leaves. And he invites us to bring our burdens, bring our sorrows, all those things to him in prayer, no matter how messy they are. Can we make some quiet space in our hearts as we prepare to do that together? Let's pray God's good words from the Psalms back to him. Can we pray the words and white out loud together? Listen, Lord, as I pray. Pay attention when I groan. You are my king and my God. Answer my cry for help. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? I'm worn out from my groaning. All night long, I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I'm in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Amen. Have mercy on me. Have mercy. Let's continue in prayer. Lord Jesus, we are groaning with all creation for the day of your return. We feel it acutely in these dark days. The list of things that are not the way they're supposed to be is staggering. Jesus, when will you come to make all things new? Lord, we need your mercy in our government in our stores, in our hospitals. We need your mercy in rooms of isolation. We need your mercy as loved ones are mourned, not with crowded funerals, but in scattered pockets of tears. Jesus, in your mercy, hear our prayer and help us. Lord, we need your mercy in homes that feel too loud and chaotic and in homes that feel far too quiet. We need your mercy when the four walls we stay in day after day feel as though they are closing in. Jesus, in your mercy, hear our prayer and help us. Lord, we need your mercy when the evening news shares more overwhelming statistics. We need your mercy because graphs that share information about exponential growth are no longer abstractions, but people we love. Jesus, in your mercy, hear our prayer and help us. Lord, we need your mercy because we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel and none of us knows how long the tunnel lasts, only you do. 
Jesus, in your mercy, hear our prayer and help us. Lord, we are collectively grieving something we don't have a category for, something so big that makes each of us feel so small. We need your help. In this holy space and time, we share our unspoken prayers for mercy with you and we lay them at the foot of your cross. Lord Jesus, we long for your return. We long for the day when you will dwell with us. The day when there will be no more sickness or sadness or dying or pain. Jesus, when will you come to make all things new? We long for the day when not just this difficulty, but everyone is swallowed up in your victory the day when you will wipe every tear from every eye and the things of the past are gone forever. Jesus, in your mercy, hear our prayer and help us. Amen.
It springs from the ground. The sun will rise. The sun will rise. Won't you dry all your tears? Lay your burden down. Won't you dry all your tears? Lay your burden down. church, all our problems, we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties, we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works, we send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes, we set on the risen Christ. Well, friends, if you recently joined us, we are thankful to be together with you worshiping in the spirit of Jesus, the risen Christ. In a moment, we're going to hear today's message. But before we do, Keith has a few important thoughts to share with us. Like Scott said, we are getting ready to dive into the Bible. But before we do that, I wanted to give you a chance to worship God through your offering. If you haven't figured out a system in this online world, you can always text any amount to the number that's on the screen. Uh, I want to tell you about something that's happening and give you a chance to pray for us and even help us with it. And that is an outreach in the deaf community. You know that in the past several months, a year, we've been looking for ways to uh, build bridges to this community so that they too could, like us, follow Jesus. And one of the things we've been able to do recently is take services and then put them online with a woman uh, who can interpret those services into the American Sign Language. And that's we're able to, like something we're able to do because of your generous giving. So if you know people who are deaf who might benefit from this, or you might just want to pray with us for this community and see if God would take these services and use them in people's life. Uh, while we're worshiping God this way in our offering, I, I want to tell you a couple of really important things that are happening here at the church. And maybe the most important thing is just how to stay connected. It's easy in this time. We don't see each other as much to get disconnected from the community. But if you go to our, our online events calendar, it tells you lots of things that are happening here you can be a part of and hopefully benefit from. So it's thecrossingchurch.com upper right-hand corner, online events, and you'll see things like stuff for crossing kids or students, uh, studies that you can be a part of, classes. We want to stay in community, our worship night on, on each evening uh, at 8 o'clock. Lots of stuff that you can find out about there. 
But let me just highlight a couple of them. One, we are having a uh, 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 lunch with the Psalms. So this is Shay and Nathan who are teaching pastors here at the Crossing. And the book of Psalms has so, so many different emotions. Confusion, doubt, celebration, anger, just all of them found in the Psalms. And they're going to walk through, of course this is all online through Zoom, but we've been having really good success with it. They'll walk through those with you and you'll learn a lot about yourself, about God, and about how He's there for you. We also have a boomers class for people in that generation, and, and you can find that also uh, in an online format where there's a c community that really cares about each other, looks out for one another, studies together. Right now, they're looking at different ways people responded to the risen Jesus. A and then finally, Patrick Miller and I are going to teach a class on uh, the book of Revelation, a book that sounds a little weird when you read it, but has a lot to say to us today in our current circumstances. So if you want to be a part of anything, any of those classes or anything else at the crossing, you go to the online events calendar, you scroll through, you find what you're looking for, you click on it, it gives you all the information that you need to be a part of it. So please do something to stay connected, help your kids, your students stay connected to what God is doing here. Now let's prepare to hear from God in the Bible. God keeps all of his promises, every single one of them. God is sure and reliable and dependable, and on his promise you can build your life. God says in Joshua 21, he says this, Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Not one failed. Every one fulfilled. See, what this verse is telling us is that God is trustworthy. That, that unlike us, God has never broken a promise and never will break a promise. That God keeps every promise he's ever made. But now catch this. He doesn't keep promises he hasn't made. And, and while in some sense when you say it, that might make sense to you, I think a lot of times we expect God to keep promises he's never made, and then we get frustrated or angry or upset or disappointed when he doesn't keep the promises he hasn't made. There's a guy named Matthew Murray, and, and I'm sure he had a lot of issues going on, but, but he, he got frustrated with God. So he walks in to a ministry, a Christian ministry in Colorado Springs, and he shoots at people. And unfortunately, he was killed in this whole scene. And, and when they were kind of trying to unravel the story and figure out what happened, they came across this note in his car that he had written. Matthew Murray said, Why didn't any changes occur or any love or help come when I accepted you as Lord and Savior? Now, now, Matthew Murray's actions were, were extreme, but that thinking, that's not extreme at all. Because that's a lot of times what we think in our head or in our heart. If we don't say it, we feel it. And you can see how we get there. Because Jesus says that with God, all things are possible. And when we hear that, we think, well, okay, I love God, he loves me, all things possible with him. And then we just start going through this list in our head, maybe a list of personal things we're dealing with. Job, family, health, kids, whatever. And we think, well, God, all things are possible with you, so why don't you make these things better? Or, or just think about what we as a, as a global community are going through with the chaos that this virus has created. And, and we can say, God, all things are possible with you, so why don't, why don't you fix this? Why don't you fix it? Because there's a lot of tragedy, a lot of people who are sick, or some people who are dying. A lot of people who are ang uh, filled with anxiety, worried, fear, lonely, disconnected from family and important people in their life. And of course, there's the economic crisis, people losing their businesses, people losing their jobs. And of course, we all know that it's those who are vulnerable, uh, economically vulnerable already to begin with. 
who are hit first and worst. Here's a picture of a food bank from Minneapolis. and It's just lines of cars, people who never thought they would ever be going to a food bank, but they've lost their job. They don't know what to do, and they're in a food bank. And, and I picked this picture out of a lot of others I could have chosen, depending on the city and the state. There are just people in these long lines. This is costing real people real important moments in their life. I had a friend whose grandmother had to die alone because people, their family, they couldn't be with her due to this virus. I have another friend, Tom and Robin May, and their son, Matt, who's 22, was recently uh, re-diagnosed. In other words, another occurrence of leukemia. They took him into Kansas City to the hospital, but they couldn't go in with him. So here they are standing on the top of a garage, looking up at him through a window, trying to let him know that they're with him. Matt's got good friends. They came all the way to Kansas City and said, Team Matt, maybe you'd want to pray for Matt and his family. Maybe you'd want to pray for lots of people who are struggling right now. There are all kinds of struggles, some things we just can't be a part of. People are missing graduations, or people are having to to put off weddings. There are sports seasons that were canceled or, or, or that people are having to just rearrange their whole life. And I, I don't mean to say all those things are of equal importance because clearly they're not. I'm just saying that all those things meant something to someone and life now is in chaos. And, and so what happens, we get frustrated with God about it. But the problem is not with God. The problem is with us. God keeps all of his promises. Every single one. The problems with us, we don't know what God has promised. If you're a sports fan, NFL fan, a Rams fan, you probably know this guy, Isaac Bruce, a key part of the the Super Bowl team in 2000, the big win. He caught the winning touchdown pass. And and you probably also, if you're an NFL fan, know this person, and that's Derek Thomas, the great Chiefs linebacker out of the University of Alabama. Leading up to the Super Bowl, Both of them were involved in a car wreck. Neither of them were buckled into their seats. When the police officers, experienced police officers, came up to the car wreck with Isaac Bruce and his girlfriend, they thought nobody lived out of this crash. It was really bad. But to their surprise, Isaac Bruce and his girlfriend walked away unharmed. In Kansas City, where Derek Thomas was in a crash, the officers walked up to that one and thought, well, this one isn't going to be that bad. But unfortunately, one of the passengers in Thomas's car died, and uh, Derek Thomas was paralyzed. He later died from a blood clot due to that paralysis. So this all happened the week leading up into the Super Bowl, and Rick Riley of the uh, Sports Illustrated, back then with Sports Illustrated, was interviewing Isaac Bruce of the Rams, and this is before the, the game, and he just said to him, he said, do you ever look at what happened to Derek Thomas and think, that could have been me? And Isaac Bruce says, no, never. He says, well, well, why not? And he goes, well, I, I, when I was in that wreck, I just took my hands off the steering wheel and yelled, Jesus. You know, Rick Riley goes, well, are you saying then if Derek Thomas had invoked the name of Jesus that he'd be okay now? And Bruce said, yeah, absolutely. And then Riley goes, well, what about Payne Stewart? Now, Payne Stewart was this well-known golfer who had died uh, recently uh, back then in a, in a mysterious uh, plane crash. And he goes, Payne Stewart was a Christian guy. And Isaac Bruce goes, yeah, but I don't know what he said on that plane. So Riley goes to the girl who, who died at, at Columbine. And, and they said, she, said, she said she believed in God, but she was killed. And, and Bruce said, well, I don't know what she said. And Rick Riley goes, but there's witnesses that she, she said she believed in God. And, and Bruce looked at him and goes, well, you weren't there, were you? You don't know for sure. Now, again, that's extreme, but do you hear that narrative? That somehow God has made a promise that we're not going to go through difficulties or hard times. He's going to bring us out of it. It's the same thing Matthew Murray thought. I believed in Jesus as my Lord and Savior, so why aren't things going better for me? Because there's an idea in our head and our heart that, that somehow God is going to deliver us from bad things. But where is that promise in the Bible? It's not there. That promise might be in your heart, but it's not in the Bible. It might be in your head, but it's not what God said. 
Now, if you're new to the crossing, maybe you've joined us because of Easter or a lot of people have been watching online uh, in the last few weeks, I just want to say thanks for being here. And maybe these are questions you've asked yourself. Where is God? Why doesn't God do more? These are questions that, that every person wrestles with at some point. And, and uh, what we do around here at the crossing is we just kind of in our sermons, we go through books of the Bible. Because we're convinced the Bible is an amazing book. It is a book that is inspired by God. One guy said the Bible was put together by literary ninjas. It only means by that is that it is a fantastic story. And every time you hear the Bible taught or read it yourself, you just think, man, that feels like it's speaking right to me. So we've taken a break the last couple weeks to celebrate Palm Sunday and Jesus' resurrection at Easter. But now we're just going to dive back into Genesis, dive back into the life of a man named Abraham. Now, when we meet him, his name is Abram, and he's living uh, in Babylon, which is one of the countries in the ancient Near East. We meet him in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. So God shows up to Abram and says, go, leave your country, leave your family, leave your security, your job, everything, and go follow me to a land you've never been to, and I'm going to make you into a great nation. Now, that's a really weird promise to make to to Abram and Sarai, his wife, because Abram's 75, and Sarai's 65, and they're childless. They had been trying for for years to have a, a kid, and they just weren't able to. So God is making this promise to make him into a great nation to a senior citizen couple who can't have kids. Well, fast forward 10 years, and they still don't have a child. Here's what it says. Abram said, and he's talking to God, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. So you can see what Abram's thinking. He's going, look, God, you made a promise. I'm sure it was in good faith. I'm sure you didn't mean to break it, but... But you're not going to be able to fulfill this one, right? Abram, you can see him thinking something like, look, God, I know what it's like to make a promise and you just can't deliver. Best intentions, I get it. So here, I got a plan. What we're going to do is we're going to make my servant your heir. That's how we're going to build this family out. And God gives Abram the hard no. Like, no, 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 no. I always keep my promises. And I promised you a son with Sarah. And that's how it's going to happen. Well, Sarai, she's thinking the same thing. Abram's wife's thinking the same thing. Like, she, she, she knows that she can't have a kid. She knows that her body is worn out. She knows that this idea that her body's going to give birth to a baby, I mean, it's just all silly, right? So look what she says in Genesis 16, 2. The Lord has kept me from having children. So now she says to Abram, go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So Abram agreed what and did what Sarah said. Now, you see that she's thinking the exact same thing that Abram was thinking, in that they both doubt God's ability to come through on his promise. So what they're doing is they're, they're seeking out some sort of human solution. God, you promised, you tried, okay, credit for that, but we're going to have to figure this out ourselves. We're going to have to come up with our own plan. We're going to have to come up with our own solution. And whenever, listen, Whenever we refuse to trust the promise of God and come up with our own solution, it always leads to foolishness. It always leads us down a path we don't want to go down. See, see, they look at God and go, poor God can't do what he thought he could do. He just overpromised. Well, fast forward another 13 years. Now there's still no kid. Genesis 17. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you're no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. So at this point, God had already changed Abram's name to Abraham, and now he's changing Sarai's name to Sarah, and and we probably don't get the power here. See, Abram, it means high father, and Abraham, father of the multitude. Sarai meant princess, and Sarah, the mother of nations. So here's this senior citizen couple who can't have kids, who have tried for decades to have their own child. But God has made this promise. They've trusted him, but they've kind of given up. Now God has changed their name. So every every time somebody says, Abraham, good morning, Sarah, what they hear is, 
Hey, father of the multitude, good morning, mother of the nations. It's like their own name begins to mock them. So we go now back to the story in Genesis 17. God says, I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Remember, that's what Sarah means, mother of nations. Kings and peoples will come from her. So God doubles down, right? God doubles down on his promise to do this by by, uh, Sarah. He's doubling down on that. And, you know, I mean, Abraham has trusted God with a lot. He's left his homeland, left his family, left his job, left his career, set out for a land he didn't know. But now at this point, he's just, his faith is beginning to waver, and I don't blame him. See, look, look what he says next. It says, Abraham fell face down, and he laughed. And he just said to himself, will a son be, more, be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? I mean, you're just like, this is ridiculous. This is not a laugh of faith. It's a laugh of, of unbelief. It's just going, look, this is impossible. It's just not going to happen. More time passes. Still no kid. Genesis 18. I will surely return to you. This is God talking. I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the, to the tent, which was behind him. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out, my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? So her response is the same as Abraham's. It's just a laugh, a laugh of unbelief, a laugh of this seems silly, a laugh of we've got to stop fooling ourselves and deal with reality. Yeah? So so here it goes. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Now, I just want you to see something here. When when God shows up in Abraham's life and says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. What's Abraham's response? Oh, God, thank you so much. Oh, God, I want your blessing. You know, so he shows up and, and says, God, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. And Abraham's like, let's say a prayer. Let's, let's call a celebration. Let's, let's have a worship service. And then he says, okay, okay, Abraham, he, here's how I'm going to bless you. And Abraham laughs. That, that you're going to bless me? That's fantastic, God. That's what I've wanted. How you're going to do it? When I hear that, well, I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is dumb. This is not what I want for a blessing. This is going nowhere right? That God blesses me, great, but how? No. So we end up doing the same thing. We pray, God, bless me. Pray pray for God's favor on our life. And then God says, okay, here's how I'm going to do it. And we're like, oh, no, that's not what I wanted. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't really want that blessing, God. I want this blessing. Because it turns out that when we pray for God's blessing and favor in our life, what we really want is our life to turn out like we want. We want like a better, a, a better version of our desire for our life. And I think what's happening is, is that we just have too narrow or maybe just a wrong definition of what it looks like to have God's blessing in our life. Listen to how Jesus defines the blessed person in, in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And those who mourn and meek and are pure in heart, hunger and thirst for righteousness, or peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted. See, that's not necessarily our definition of the blessed life, is it? So maybe our problem is that that we've got the wrong definition. We've created our own definition. Maybe the problem isn't with God, but the problem is with us and how we've defined the blessed life. Because what we want is God's blessing, but not how. We want our definition of it. And so Abraham Abraham and Sarah, they just laugh at God. And I get why. I mean, I totally get it. Look at all the obstacles. Look at their age. Look how long they've been trying to have kids. Their bodies are shutting down. Their body parts do not work the way they once used to. God's not going to do this until he does. Genesis 21. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said. 
And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time that God had promised him. So do you see that the emphasis is on the promise of God? God delivers on his promises. God keeps his promises. Abram gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah born to him. So maybe you missed the, the irony of this here. But let me help you. What Isaac means is Isaac means laughter. They named their kid Laughter. So that every time they called Isaac, Isaac, time for dinner. Isaac, don't touch that. Isaac, let's go to bed now. Every time they said his name, they were reminded that God kept his promises, but that they hadn't believed him. That they'd laughed at God's promise. See, God overcomes every obstacle. He overcomes their age. He overcomes their bodies. He even overcomes their unbelief. He does exactly what he said he'd do. He said, you will have a son, and God delivered the son. Exactly how it would happen. He said it would come by Sarah, and that's exactly how God delivered that child. He did exactly when he said he'd do it. This time next year, you'll have a son, and he did. See, God is dependable. God is reliable. We can build our life on his sure promise. But I want to show you a problem that we have. And it has to do with this this thing that God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? And of course, really, that's a statement. That's a rhetorical question. What what it's really saying is that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Now, Now, here's the issue, is that we turn this truth into a promise. It's not a promise. God's power is an attribute of his that that should give us hope. It's It's a truth about God that should sustain us, that nothing is too difficult for him. But when we turn into a promise, then we begin to think that that means that God is going to do whatever we want in life. Like, here's something I want, and well, nothing's too hard for God, right? So I'm sure we'll get it. I, I want to get into this college, and maybe my grades aren't great. Or maybe my grades are great, and, I, and my test scores are, are great, but it's this super selective college. So I say, well, God will do it, right? Because nothing's too hard for God. Or maybe it's get out of debt. And we just think, maybe there's a check in the mail. Maybe we should buy a lottery ticket because God wants me out of debt. And remember, nothing's too hard for God. Or, or we're dating or pursuing a relationship with a person who's not following Jesus like, like we want to follow him. And, and we just think, well, uh, you know, God will bring them to faith. Nothing's too hard for God. So we get this idea that what God wants to do is to do everything that we want him to do. But what if God doesn't want that? What if God doesn't want to get us out of every difficult circumstances we're in? What if God doesn't want to make all our dreams come true? Instead, what if God wants to keep us where we don't want to be, but he wants to do that so that he can grow us in, his, in our faith? So maybe you're a couple who has struggled to have children. You just have fertility issues. And, and can God give you a, a, a biological child? Absolutely. It's really true. Nothing is too hard for God. But can God also give you a joyful, meaningful life without kids? Absolutely, because nothing is too hard for God. If you're dating or pursuing a relationship with someone who's not following Jesus, can God bring that person to faith? Yes. Nothing's too hard for God. But can God work in your life through you obeying Jesus and putting him above this other relationship? And obeying him and maybe having to end that relationship? Yeah, God can work there too because nothing's too hard for God. Can God heal you from this disease that ravages your body? Absolutely, because nothing's too difficult for him. But can he also give you the grace to sustain your faith and to be a light to those around you? Yeah, because nothing's too hard for God. Can God deliver you from hardship? Yes, But can he also use that hardship in your life to make you more like Jesus and to grow you in your faith? Yeah. See, we don't get to dictate to God what blessings will come in our life. We don't get to say, God, here's how I want you to bless my life. Now do it my way. When life is hard, we don't get to claim this promise. Nothing's too hard for God as if that gets us out of it. 
Yes, God can change the circumstances that we find ourselves in because he is all powerful. But he can also keep us in those circumstances and use them in our life in a way that might be even more miraculous than delivering us from them. If you've never met a woman named Jerry Joni Erickson Tata, I want to introduce you to her. Uh, I have never met her, but I've been reading about her lately. She's someone I've been familiar with in my life, but, but only recently I've really dug into her story. Here she is. She's now 70 years old. She uh, is a quadriplegic. That happened when she was 17. Very athletic, very outdoorsy family. She dives off a raft into a river and uh, uh, breaks her back in a way that renders her as a quadriplegic. That happened in 1967. The story of her struggle with that is intense and, and pretty amazing in that first year, what she went through. Eventually, she comes to the conclusion that, that God wants to heal her. See, she had become a Christian in high school, and, and God wants to heal her. So she would go around to these healing crusades where they're going to heal people. But every time she left still in her wheelchair, still with her being a quadriplegic, she ended up, has lived now a pretty amazing life. She, she's an artist. She does, she's written books, you know, like this is a picture of her doing her art, or she's written all kinds of books. She's a really impressive person. But what I'm most interested in and intrigued by with her is how she has thought about, from a very Christian perspective, how she has thought about her, her being a quadriplegic and being in this wheelchair and unable to use her arms or legs or most of her body. But listen to what she wrote in one of her books. She says, My affliction, the, the quadriplegia, ha has stretched my hope, made me know Christ better, helped me long for truth, led me to repentance of sin, goaded me to give thanks in times of sorrow, increased my faith, and strengthened my character. Being in this wheelchair has meant knowing him better, feeling his pleasure every day, if that doesn't qualify as a miracle in your book, well then, may I say it in all kindness, I prefer my book to yours. My book, of course, being the Bible. D does Johnny Erickson Todd think that God could heal her of her quadriplegia so that she could walk? She does. But she also believes that nothing is too difficult for God and that God can use this in her life to do amazing things, to draw her closer to Jesus, as she said, and to use her to help other people find life and meaning and purpose in Jesus so she can thank God for her wheelchair because nothing is too hard for God. I, I want to tell you one more story. It was long, happened a long time ago. I was finishing up seminary and... I had to uh, take this pastoral internship class, which meant being an intern at a church up in the Chicago area. And I was assigned to show up at this place and do Q&A with people. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, no idea what I was doing. But here I show up, and these people show up around this table, and I'm there answering their questions. And the uh, one woman says to me, I have a, a son who's uh, autistic. Is it okay if I pray that God would deliver uh, him from the autism? And, and it's just a sincere, heartfelt question, as you could imagine. And here I am, uh, full of knowledge, but very, very little uh, life experience. I don't know what I'm doing. And I just sat there and I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to say? And I just silently prayed, God, give me something to say that will help this woman. And I think God did give me something to say. What I said to her was, first, I want you to know your son is fortunate to have a mother who loves him as much as you do and is with him no matter what and will pray for him. I would pray for him this way. Pray whatever you want for him, but then pray what Jesus taught us to pray back in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you remember there, the night before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed, yet not as I will, but as you will. God, take this cup of judgment from me, but not as I will, but as you will. And I think that that is true for that mom with an autistic child, or for you or I in whatever hardship of life that we are experiencing right now. That we can say, God, we pray for healing, or we pray for you to change things, but 
not what I want, God, but what you want, because what I want is your will, or at least I want to want your will more than anything else, because I know that your will is best. Your blessing is best. So God, bless me in whatever way you think would be best. I trust you, God. You always keep your promises. Now I'm going to ask you to do something that you might feel uncomfortable with, and I probably wouldn't ask you if you were here. It just wouldn't really even be feasible. And that is that I'm asking you to consider just getting down on your knees and praying with me. I think sometimes when we get down on our knees, our body just shows a humility and a dependence. And by getting on our knees and praying, we're just saying, God, we want your will more than our will. We trust you. We submit to you. We believe that you keep your promises. So maybe with your family, just get on your knees together. A friend, whoever, by yourself. And if it's too weird, that's fine. You can get down on the knees in your heart if you want. That's okay. But I'm just going to get down my knees here and just surrender to God and submit to God in His will in my life and just say, God, we believe your promise. Your will, Lord, not our will, be done. Let's pray. Father, we are here on our knees and we are asking for your blessing and we are surrendering and submitting to your will for our life. We want to build our life on the faithfulness of God, on the faithfulness of God who always keeps his promises. Our eyes, our heart, we're all fixed on you, Jesus. You are our life, you are everything. Help us, Jesus, to believe your promise. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Please receive God's blessing. May our faithful God, our trustworthy, promise-keeping God give you endurance. May you find your hope in him. May he satisfy your soul. He is faithful. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Have a great Sunday.